there's this wonderful concept of slowly adding art into your life. And the more art you add into your life, the more creative you become, and the more you create yourself. Because you don't actually find yourself, you create yourself. And the more you involve yourself in artistic endeavors, the more you can create that self. This is a story about Jabba the Hutt. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, I remember it was 1977, that's exactly when Star Wars came out. And I grew up in Dallas, Texas. And I don't know if you've ever been to Dallas, Texas in the summer, but it is hot, like unforgiving, humid, hot, like a sticky, sticky hot. It's the kind of place where you go from like air conditioned environment to air conditioned environment. And you've got about like five minutes to, to get there before you just get soaked out. Um, and so one of the coolest places to go when I was growing up, and literally coolest, is the, uh, the movie theater. And I remember my dad took me to this big, huge movie theater. And we're going to go see this thing called Star Wars, which nobody had ever heard of. And we went in there and sat down. It was so cool and comfy. We had our popcorn and, and ready for it to go. And then, then there's just that dramatic opening scene, you know, where the... Uh, Imperial cruiser is chasing Princess Leia's little ship. Um, and I was overwhelmed when I saw this thing. I thought, how is something this awesome even, even possible? You know, the, the movie uh, unfolded and you got to see all these amazing sights and it was a great story and I was completely blown away that anything like that was even possible. And then so, fast forward 20 years to 1997. Um, when the new Star Wars movies came out, I thought it would be kind of fun and, and nice and uh, cool if I took my dad to see the new movie uh, 20 years later. And I'm a big fan of going to see movies like on opening day or opening night. I think it's really exciting. So the only way to get in early to see this movie is there was this auction, this celebrity auction, uh, where you could, you could pay or you know, buy an auction spot and you could go with one of the original stars from the original Star Wars. Uh, uh, the top billing, this was in Dallas again, uh, the top billing at this particular thing was uh, Billy D. Williams, Lando Calrissian. Um, and, but he was too expensive. I just wanted like the cheapest possible uh, ticket so my dad and I can go. And so we kind of bid on maybe like the, the lower level stars. But Lando Calrissian went for like, you know, eight or nine hundred dollars or something. And um, I put in the lowest possible bid, and it turns out that we won. We got two tickets. Um, and the star that we got to go with was the guy that played Jabba the Hutt's tail. And um, he was, you know, a, a little person. Um, and he would squeeze into the tail, and like at certain times, he would hear a sound in his ear, and he would just like wiggle around. That was his big role. Um, so anyway, we got to go to the movie. It was really fun because uh, we were like in a limo with him, and he's a really nice guy. He's actually this kind of royal Shakespearean actor guy, and I think it was a little belittling to him that he actually had to be inside the, the tail of an alien like that. Um, but my dad and I went to the movie, and it was, it was just a really nice experience, and it kind of connected all these things together for me, like how can, um, you know, over 20 years, you still have sort of this Star Wars thing. It, it was so strange that it affected me so heavily and affected my entire being. Um, here's like a... a before I get to the kind of the main point of this story, I want to do a little aside. I'm sure you can keep two concepts in your in your head at once. Um, and it was about this new movie. So you might have your own opinion. I thought the new Star Wars movie, The Phantom Menace, was like a terrible, terrible movie. And that in itself was a super vexing thing to me. And I've actually thought about it a lot. I haven't talked about this with anybody. These are all just sort of inside musings. It's nice to wonder about things, isn't it? Without you know, actually having to look up why things happen, I wonder a lot. This is one of these wonderings, like how... Okay, George Lucas, all right. Um, he, when he comes to make the second set of three movies, he has um, infinite resources, you know, very wealthy, infinite time, the movie studio, his movie studio, will give him as much time as he wants, and he has you know, pretty much infinite experience. He's made a ton of movies. He knows a lot of people, has all the connections. So you would think, like, as an artist, that if you have infinite time, infinite resources, and infinite experience, that you could make incredibly awesome stuff all the time. You know, don't we think about that as photographers? Like, you know, oh, if we just had all this equipment, 
if we had all the time in the world and we had all the money in the world, we could go anywhere, we could do anything, when we make the most amazing photos. And this is what I love that's so counterintuitive about this, because clearly that didn't work for him. And you actually see this happening time and time again. When an artist or a team or anything is given infinite time, infinite resources and uh, you know, experience or connections, it doesn't mean it's going to be successful. I think one of my learnings from that and other experiences in my life is that you've got to keep yourself super uncomfortable. I mean, it's counterintuitive. Uh, but the more uncomfortable you make yourself, the more you try different things, the more you experiment, you've got to have this sort of uh, tension in order to create something interesting. Well, back to the story. Uh, so, when I went back with my dad, uh, we were talking about Star Wars and, and why it affected me so much. And, and I didn't really realize that what you could do in art is completely manipulate the light in a situation. George Lucas in these movies, first ones in particular, although let's, let's stop talking about the good ones and the bad ones. But I learned back in 1977 that you can completely manipulate the light in your universe to be whatever you want. Um, this was a new concept to me because I would see other movies that were shot in one way or another. Um, but it never struck me. Like I just felt like HDR uh, or high dynamic range light just blasting out of me for that entire two hours. And it had such an impact on me, it completely changed the way that I, I felt about uh, really everything. Uh, so it wasn't just a story about sci-fi and ships fighting and stuff, it just really changed the way I saw the world. And I think probably back then, um, you know, when I was six years old, my, my dad had no idea what kind of impact that would have on my life. But it's very, um, it's awesome. Um, Sorry, in a moment. Okay, I want to tell you about what my settings are for this for this situation. So I love shooting in deserts, um, and shooting in deserts is always a little bit tough. Um, today's a nice day; it's not always so nice. I do a lot of hiking in deserts. Um, I mean, yesterday uh, we hiked up. I'm here with Bell. We hiked up this thing called Big Daddy. It is ridiculous how tall that thing is. Um, it was a, halfway up. I thought this is a real mistake. But I was taking pictures all the way and, you know, just trying to sort of a personal, physical, mind-body challenge there. So you got to really think about what stuff you're going to carry in the desert. Now, in the middle of the daytime, you'll notice that I don't have a tripod. I think this is, well, this might be the only thing that we've shot where I'm not sitting by a, a tripod. <laughs> um, and I just got all my handheld stuff. Honestly, now, in the middle of the day, I don't even use a tripod. Uh, low light situations, I use a tripod. I'm all kind of handheld. Um, yes, I do um, HDR sometimes, but a lot of times I don't. Either way, you can just go handheld. So I'll tell you exactly about my, my setup here in this particular situation and what I'm seeing and what I'm shooting. Um, you'll see I have two cameras um, hanging around me. Uh, why two cameras, you ask? It's because, really, I'm super lazy and I hate changing lenses. Um, I feel like um, sometimes if I want to get a, a wide-angle shot or a zoom-in shot, sometimes I find that, uh, I'm just going to skip it. I, I can't be bothered to change lenses. Ain't nobody got time for that. Uh, so now I just carry two. It's so convenient. And these cameras, honestly, are so light, you know, these Sony cameras. Um, so I'll tell you specifically what I have here. Uh, I'll start with this one. Uh, this is a Sony a7R. All right. And on it, I have a, a 10 to 18 millimeter lens. This is a wide angle lens. Um, I also have a really small bag, and the only other lens I have really in there is my uh, 24 to 70. All right. Um, I do have another prime lens for close up type stuff, but as far as landscapey stuff goes, it's basically this my 24 to 70, and this guy. All right. So, what is this, you ask? Uh, well, this is not a Sony A7R, um, even though I do, I do have a, another one, um, but this is sort of what I call my Africa situation. Okay. Um, this is the Sony A6000, all right, and upon it I have placed the 70 to 200 millimeter lens. So the difference between the A6000 and the A7R is that the A6000 is a cropped sensor, all right, which means the sensor is a little bit smaller, and it means that every lens you put on there is just a, it has sort of a different uh, reaction with the, with the camera. For this particular one, it multiplies everything by uh, an extra 50%. So this 70 to 200 
now actually zooms all the way into um, 300. So this is a 300 millimeter lens. So it's great for wildlife, for zooming, all sorts of stuff. Um, the other big reason that I like this camera in particular uh, for wildlife shooting or action shooting is it does um, 11 frames per second, which is incredible. I mean, I, surely if I see an animal running, I'll be able to, to be able to get it right. So anyway, um, this is my setup here. I'm going to be moving around, taking a lot of shots, and um, we'll just see what we get. Hello, so we're going straight from Tatooine right here to my studio back in Queenstown. I want to take you through some photos here. And <clears throat> we're going to work on uh, three of them together. Uh, these are the three that we're going to work on. Uh, this is sort of the final version. This amazing leopard we tracked forever and finally caught her up in this tree. And um, I do love this shot. So we'll work on this one together. Um, we'll also work on this one. This is what was behind me while I was filming that. And this will be a nice little entree into Lightroom. Okay, I'll teach you how to use that a little bit. All right, just to get the show started. And then uh, we'll also do this one. I think this is sort of a nice study of ripples in sand. Um, sort of a simple shot. And then we'll do this one as well. Um, let's look at a few other photos while we're here that I just kind of enjoy taking uh, around with these various lenses and cameras you just saw. Um, this is a, a few young lions. Uh, you can see the one on the left is a female, the one on the right is a male. He's just starting to get his mane there. Um, here's a wild dog, uh, also called a, a painted wolf or even a painted ornate. Awesome name. Huh? These are super rare, super endangered in fact. I was there with my friend Neville Jones, and he's been to Botswana seven times, and this is the first time he's ever seen wild dogs. Amazing creatures. Um, here's a, <laughs> this is a baby lion cub. So fierce, isn't it? So fierce. It was so tiny and awesome. Um, here's this huge hippo that uh, just rose up out of the water, started chasing us out of our, uh, we were in a boat. I think we got a little close, he got a little upset. That uh, hippo was not a fan of ours. Here is a, uh, a lady lion. Um, don't want to upset her. She looks a little bit um, upset here. By the way, this is a series of three black and white photos I did. This is the second one. I don't always do black and white, but sometimes I do like it. When it's about the shapes and the, the line and the contrast, I like to go black and white. Here's the last one. This is a pair of elephants. A, a mommy elephant and a kind of adolescent elephant there. And I like how they, uh, one is facing us and one is kind of sideways. Reminds me of that final scene um, from uh, that Woody Allen movie where he and Diane Cannon are saying uh, wheat. Uh, here is another female lion who is none too happy. Um, actually, she was unhappy because <laughs> she was covered in her baby cubs and they were all trying to, to get her, her milky milk. Here's a kudu, just kind of stand large and proud up there. Those are big animals, I tell you. Uh, oh, one thing I found out about kudu is you can tell how old they are by how many spirals they have on their horns. I think it's, um, I think it's uh, one year every spiral and a half. Um, here's a couple uh, baby lion cubs um, sleeping on mom. So cute. Here's an elephant uh, kind of crossing the road right in front of us. And you'll notice how it tries to make his body as big as possible to seem intimidating. Um, here's another study of three elephants. This one is a little bit more black and whitish with a bit more of a color tone to it. I thought the shapes were very nice and they were lined up in such nice succession. Um, here's another little family of elephants. Um, this one on the right, she has her trunk up high because she's uh, trying to smell us to see what we're all about. This is, these are not great <laughs> photos here, but they are kind of funny. So I went back to my room um, to get my wife, the dragon lady. Um, she, was, she was trapped in there because this elephant had come and uh, kind of blocked off the path. And she was yelling at me to get help. But I said, well, hold on, I got to take some photos. So I ended up staying here for a while to take photos while she was trapped and, you know, complaining vociferously. I was like, you should be quiet. I got to get this shot. Um, but then anyway, so while I was shooting, my friend Pete came over. And uh, he started getting closer to try to get a good shot. Pete has generally not the best judgment, um, as you might be able to see. 
Um, and then it started to charge us. So Pete started uh, hauling. This is Pete's alert face when he's getting charged. So he basically just kind of got the heck out of there. <laughs> and I want to end with these two photos um, before I you know, do a little um, sample or demo here uh, of these wild dogs. I like how this guy looks like he's just smiling. We really anthropomorphize these guys, don't we? We kind of you know, paint our own human emotions on top of them. And then look at this, from this photo to that photo. Look at that mouth. Can you imagine? That is a wild dog. If you want to read more about him, I actually wrote a whole story on the blog about our adventure with the Painted Wolf. So you can always pop over to Stuck in Customs and search for the Painted Wolf. And you'll find it. Okay. All right, so let's work on some photos here. Team. Team awesome. Um, and let's start uh, with this one. Let me give you the briefest of tours and let me tell you what's happening here with my, with my setup. Okay. So I'm using Adobe Lightroom, and Adobe Lightroom is a great way for you to organize and um, uh, work on your photos, okay? Um, you can see that I have 365,000 photos, uh, basically 1,000 photos for every day of the year, I guess. Um, and you can see down here, they're separated into years. Uh, this has been a productive year so far, 85,000 photos. It's not even done. Um, so this is kind of the folders where everything is organized, okay? It's kind of sorted by date, I guess. And then inside here, let me see, I have this one directory here called uh, Africa. We'll go find it. Inside Africa, you can see I took 14,000 photos. Um, that's a bit of a misnomer in a way because I flew a, a quadcopter, which takes like, um, you know, one photo every two seconds. So that added up to quite a few photos too. What I do, and I'm not going to go into a huge workflow thing right here, but I just thought you might want to know, is I uh, give my photos um, stars, you know, one, two, or one star or five stars or what have you. And uh, then I go through and then I pick my favorite ones and then I go through and I, I edit them, okay? Um, so then I end up with, um, like this is a, an edited five star photo that I'd worked on. Um, so on and so forth. But you'll see me do this time and time again as we, uh, as we go through these various episodes, all right. Now, what else is happening here? Um, if you open up Africa, you can see that I have a bunch of different days all separated here. Okay, it's all organized by date. You see some days I took a ton of photos, some days hardly any, okay. But I really don't play in these directories very much because what happens is I use these things called collections, okay. So, this is basically all of my um, photos from Africa that I call my five star photos. These are all st photos that I like, I want to work on someday that I think like might have some kind of uh, potential, all right, from across the whole trip. And then as I work on them, um, I start deleting them from the collection so that they are, um, they're considered processed, okay. As I work on a few of them, like right now, I brought a group of 10 of them into processing now. So these are the 10 photos I was going to process now. This is a little bit of the workflow, okay? I don't really go up and play with the directories anymore. I just play in these collections. This is sort of a series of special collections just for this series, so I can just stay, stay organized, just stay on task, okay? So anyway, these are the 10 photos we're going to process right now. And if I went a little fast, don't worry, you'll see me do this stuff again and again as we go through the series. All right. Now, over here we have 10 photos. Okay, let's start with this one. Okay, and we'll do a little demo on how um, Photoshop, or how uh, Lightroom works. Okay. Um, up here in the top right, we can see the, this is called the EXIF info. All right, you can kind of see how I took the shot. It was ISO 64, 17 millimeters, F8, 1 200th of a second. Okay. We're gonna go into the develop module now because this is where the magic happens. All right, this is where you make the photo look uh, better, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and click reset just to kind of get it back to its core, all right? This is it when I originally took the photo. Okay, now we're gonna do a few tweaks in here just to make it look a little bit better, all right? The first thing we're gonna do is crop it in. As you can see, I have a little bit of a black ring here because I was, um, on that particular lens, if you go super wide, you get a little bit of this vignetting here. So we're just gonna crop it and get rid of that, okay? So I'm gonna click that and then I move over the corners and I can squeeze it in, squeeze in a little bit. And we're not really losing anything, are we? It still looks pretty good. I would probably just shot it a little too wide, okay? And I often do shoot it sometimes a little too wide. I don't mind coming in and cropping. No shame in a crop, 
No shame in a crop. I consider artifice in your craft to be a sign of glory. Now, let me play with some of these other controls and show you how this works. So you see all these delicious Willy Wonka-esque sliders here. Um, these are all yours to control and have fun with. Um, you could be like a kid. You know, I think sometimes uh, people are afraid to play with this stuff that they'll mess it up, but just be like a kid and have a fun time with it and experiment. Whoop, I've got a meeting coming up. Um, so what's gonna happen here is I'm gonna start playing with these controls and I'll show you how they work. Okay, let's start with the contrast. You see as I move the contrast up and down, see how it gets just more inky and nice down there? Cool. Um, let's play with the contrast, or the, uh, sorry, the highlights. We'll move this up and down. This is kind of increasing the brightness of those distant dunes, which I like. The shadows, uh, we can bring the shadows up a little bit. Um, the whites, we'll kind of leave that alone. The blacks, we'll leave alone a little bit. Clarity makes things kind of sharper or softer. I think we're gonna go a little bit soft here just because we want soft sand. I think it's nice when sand is a little bit soft. And then maybe we'll adjust the vibrance here a little bit too. Okay, that made the uh, sky nice and inky, didn't it? Now my lens is a little bit dirty. I have something there on my, or actually my sensor. So let's clean that little bit up right there. We can do that by clicking on this one, okay. I'm gonna make my brush a little bit bigger with the right bracket. Okay, you can also move the so size thing back and forth. Let me just color over that, make a little line, and we'll just try to fix it like that, perfect. I see another little one right here, little dot right there. So let's just pop that dot just like that. Pop it like it's hot, drop it like it's hot. Good, close. That looks pretty good. Um, we can also go down and do a little bit of noise reduction if we want to, way down here. Uh, this is noise reduction, pull that up a little bit. We can always choose to do a little bit of a vignetting too. I don't think we will, but you can just slide this around just to see what happens. That makes it a little too dramatic, but it's an option for you. Um, anyway, those sliders that I just showed you are the ones that I use the most. Now, as we go through the other series, uh, or the other episodes in this series, you'll see me use a lot of these different controls, and you'll really get the, get the hang of it. You'll have a good time with it. All right, so that's that shot. By the way, you can zoom in. You click here and zoom in and see... Um, you know, all of the nice detail. You can just click anywhere. And, um, I love it. So cool. Um, let's look at this one really fast. Um, and let's, um, let's kind of see what we did to make this happen. Um, every shot has a history. Okay, so this is sort of like a, a, uh, a list of all the things that's, that's been done to it. And it saves this stuff forever. You can see right now I'm kind of stepping back in time I did a lot of different things, um, and we'll go through all of this um, in, in later lessons. You'll see how I use all these different things, right? Um, and if we go all the way to the beginning, this is how it started. And then after I did these various uh, maneuvers on it, um, you can see this is how it ended up. Okay, I like this. I did leave it overexposed like this on the bottom on purpose. Um, I think it looks really cool, really cool. Um, now let's go over and look at some of these uh, leopard shots, and I'll show you of this series my favorite one. You remember me saying when I was there on the sand dune that if I shoot 11 frames per second, surely I'll get a good animal shot. And I got actually a lot of good ones, but I'll show you my favorite one out of this series. I'm not going to throw the others away, but I'll show you my favorite one. And if, we, if I zoom out here, I press G or go back to the library to zoom out, um, you can see that I have eight different shots here, and I'll show you my, uh, my favorite one. Okay, um, so this is this is one of them. Let's cycle through. He's sitting up there, just um, or she's sitting up there chewing up this warthog she just caught and dragged to the tree, and she actually dragged it up there because um, you know it's safe. That's where they keep their their food when they're when they want to protect it. Look at that. I mean, you could just hear those bones crunching in a soul bending way. And so this is the final shot that I ended up with right here. Okay, so let's, um, let's step through this and see what, um, what I've done. Okay, how did this happen? Um, actually, let's go to this one, I'm sorry. So you can see this uh, history here. Um, let's go back to the very beginning and see how it started. It started like this, okay? Which is pretty much cropped exactly the same. Um, and if you wanna see the settings for this shot, by the way, this was ISO 800. 600 millimeter, f6.3, one four thousandth of a second. Okay. So 
the final shot, I'll tell you the big difference is it's zoomed in a little bit bigger and I really brought some more drama to the eyes, okay? Because she was looking right at me. And so if you look here, you can see this is the final shot. She is much brighter and her eyes are much brighter. Um, if, if we go through here and see what we did, let's start from the beginning and kind of go forward, okay? Um, so the very first thing I did is apply a, uh, one of my presets to it, okay? And one of my presets, um, it's sort of a, a, a preset that brightens everything up. And you can see over here what's happened. Um, you can kind of uh, reverse engineer what has happened. Uh, the contrast moved up a little bit. Uh, the shadows have been brought up. That does a lot. You know, if you shoot in RAW, when you, can, um, when you come into Lightroom, you can really pull up those shadows. So those things that were dark, remember how dark the initial one was? Watch this by pulling up the shadows and the blacks. All this awesome stuff happens. All right. Um, the clarity went up a little bit. The vibrance went up a little bit. Um, and I don't think too much else has changed. I'm going to do a little bit of noise reduction here. Okay. And let's go ahead and crop in just a little bit, just to get the action a little bit more right around um, uh, the head, because that's right where it's at. And if you notice, I have lines of phi here, the golden ratio. And I often like the lines of phi to intersect right between the eyes. It's a subtle thing, uh, but people certainly um, notice it. Okay. Now if we do want to brighten up the eyes, um, we're just going to jump to that step right now and I'll show you how that works. Okay, let's do the noise reduction a little bit more. Okay, you can see here, by the way, if you look at this area, um, you can see all those little dots in there, that's noise. But as, a, as I increase the noise reduction, you'll see that kind of smooths out a little bit. Okay. So we're going to pick this brush. Okay, I'm going to click on the adjustment brush and then make this a little bit smaller. And if you notice, the exposure is way up right now, okay? This will just kind of help me see where I'm painting. So I'm going to click here, kind of go right along the eyes, go right along the eyes, just like this. You can see, of course, that's ridiculously bright. But I'm going to bring this back down to normal, and you see now it's normal. And if I brighten it up a little bit, it looks kind of nice, doesn't it? Let's get some contrast in there, too. We want to make sure the pupils stay nice and dark. Okay, let's get those, get those shadows up a little bit. Okay, just a little bit brighter. We could also warm it up a little bit here by sliding the temperature over to the right. It can look a little bit more glowy. All right, looking good. Looking very good. Maybe that's a little much. <laughs> Usually you have to do it a little bit less than you think you do. There we go. Okay, so those just little adjustments that we made, if we look at the before, this is the, the backslash. You have to go before and after, before to after. All right. Well, that's a little um, quick um, intro to Lightroom, and you're going to see me use this a lot more, and I cannot wait to see you in the next episode. Where will we go next? Only the shadow knows. There's this quote that I might get it a little bit wrong here, uh, but a photograph is a secret of a secret. And the more it tells you, the less you know.